you're you're still muted, Ron. Thing up there, that's just yeah, that's it. You've done it now. All right. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Now I understand you've got a church business meeting next Monday. And then I reckon we've only got kind of two studies after that. Um, and that will bring us to the end of um, this introduction to Galatians. <laughs> uh, so um, I want to sort of gather some things up and um, try and explain how I see the links in Galatians. Um, I do see there's one kind of whole revelation of God. And there are some, I've mentioned this before, there are some wonderful kind of um, insights that we're given to Paul's relationship to these young churches, uh, to the way that he expects churches to function, to the way that he expects people to be able to live. And it, it always it does excite me when I, I see the admonitions that Paul gives to the churches. Um, uh, he had great expectations because he believed in the Holy Spirit. He, he believed it was possible for the Holy Spirit to change people radically, men and women, and make them capable of an entirely different lifestyle. I don't know whether you know much about a man whose name was Barclay Buxton. I won't get into the whole story of him, but he was um, one of the founders of the Japan Evangelistic Band, and later on, uh, people like Paget Wilkes joined him. And he was a very godly man from a very high uh, class background. And he went out at, into um, to Japan and was there for several years. And uh, he did quite a bit of writing and he was a Bible teacher. And uh, one of the things he wrote in the margins of his Bible on one occasion was this. He, he just made a little note and he said, the, 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 the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles both cover a period of about 30 years, he said. Think about that. The Gospels, about 30 years, and the Acts of the Apostles, about 30 years. And then he said, it is designed to show us what God can do in one generation with men and women who are filled with the Spirit. And, and he, they started in Japan absolutely from ground zero, uh, with no kind of things to start with, and they began to evangelize, and they believed, as the Japan Evangelistic Band did, they believed very strongly in second blessing holiness, and they believed that people, if they came into the fullness of the Holy Spirit, they'd be able to function in the life of the Holy Spirit, and consequently, they could do great things, and they did do great things. It's, um, there's a book called The Reward of Faith in the Life of Barclay Buxton. It was written by his son. If you can get a copy um, it is an excellent book, particularly anyone who is interested in mission and the way mission operates. It's a fascinating book. Anyway, um, I, Paul believed that God could do things in one generation. Uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't think it would going to take kind of hundreds of years to lay down a kind of a Christian subculture. Um, he believed that God could take hold of men and women, fill them with the spirit and make them new creatures. And because of that, he was he had great expectations of the ad, uh, admonitions that he passed on to these Christians. I, that to me is exciting. Maybe that's just a, one of my many oddities. I'm just going to look at some verses and we're just going to dig into some verses and look at some of the words, because I think some of these words, without getting kind of too technical, I'll, I'll hide some of them anyway, but you can then kind of dig down as deeply as you want to later on if you want to use particularly the html or the pdf um uh posts that i'll, I'll send out to you so this is galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 and this has gone back a little bit it's just before that section which begins to speak about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the spirit being contrary the one to the other so here in galatians 5 and verse 16 paul says this i say then in other words, this is following on from what he's been saying before. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And this is a statement I want to make that however we interpret what has gone before and what is coming next as regards the contrariness 
of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the spirit, it has to be consistent with this statement. However you interpret it, you have to be able to put this at the beginning of it and at the end of it. That if we walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So sin is not inevitable. Um, many, many, many Christians believe it is. I mean, the, uh, the people like John Piper, who really have taken it to the very kind of extreme uh, catching up kind of some of the language of uh, Jonathan Edwards um, and, and believe that they're sinning all the time. You know, every day I sin, every moment I sin. And that's that's um, a kind of a, a line or kind of a theme that came through with the Calvinists. And, and because it's inevitable, it is it, it just will be so. But it isn't inevitable if you believe this simple statement. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, whatever your views are of sanctification, that has to be true of them. We have to, we have to embrace the fact that there is a, a, a type of life that Paul is referring to here, where to yield to the lust of the flesh is not inevitable. And if we walk in the Spirit, you will not, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So let's just have a look at the way that this little sentence is introduced. This is just kind of talking about um, words. Well, I've done, done this before, I think. There are several conjunctions, words like and and but in Greek. And there's a, there's a kind of another one that's sort of in the middle. It's not, it's not quite and, and it's not but. It's a, it is a kind of a conjunction, but it, it emphasizes the fact that there is a, slight, a shift of some kind. It's not... It's not in contrast to like a but is, but there is a shift. It can be a contrast as well. Anyway, um, it, it's it's this little word. Day. I'm gonna. That's the chi word, which is and. But this this is this one here, um, and it's sometimes even. So it, it, you can get something like I I say then even. In other words, following on from what I've said before, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's. I'll close that down so it doesn't distract you. And we'll come on to this one, walk. Now, I'm concentrating on this word because we're going to come across another word shortly, which is the same word walk, but it's not the same Greek word. In fact, it's a very, very different Greek word. And I think there's, um, there's a lot of, what can we say? Um, I don't think it's been embedded or hidden so that we don't see it. Um, it's just that when you do see it, I think you begin to see sort of the atmosphere, the framework of the way that the scriptures are revealing something here. So here's this word, that walk. It's a Greek word, peripateo. Now, if you know the word patio, that's the bit that you walk on uh, outside your house. A peri is around, and technically, originally, peripateo meant to walk around or just to walk about, just to, not in any particular direction. And it was the manner of some of the, um, the philosophers of Paul's day that they were known as peripatetic philosophers. And what they did is that they, they walked around as they taught and they asked lots and lots of questions, which often they answered themselves. Uh, so you'll, you'll kind of see that Paul had a bit of that style in the way that he did. So this is the ordinary work. And it means in, in many ways just to, just to be getting on with things just carrying on just just moving about i was asked to speak many years ago now at um a church's uh, away weekend and uh, they gave me the choice of what i was going to preach uh, on and and i made that choice and then i got that and they said um oh we we use the let me think, the niv version here i said oh i'm, I'm sure i will be okay and what I wanted to speak on was walking in the spirit. Now, I don't know whether you're familiar with the NIV, but you, you don't get walking in the spirit in the NIV at all. And the reason you don't get walking in the spirit is because the NIV is a more dynamic um, uh, translation. And so they say, well, don't, don't, don't tell me what the individual words mean. Just tell me what the whole thing means. And they say, well, it, it really just means getting on with life, living. So throughout the NIV, you don't, you, well, the older ones, I don't know whether they changed it, 
um, you didn't get walk in the spirit or any of the references to walk in the spirit. You just got live. They took put live. Uh, but that of course is a bit of a problem as we'll see later on um, in Galatians, because Paul will say, if we live in the spirit, then walk in the spirit. Uh, so there are subtle differences here, but they're really quite important. The normal word for just a way of life, just getting on with things is peripateo. Um, and it's a, it's a metaphor for walking from walking. Um, and uh, that, that's it. But we're going to come across another word, which isn't peripateo, um, shortly. Okay. And this one here. This is fulfill. This is teleo. Um, that's where you get teleological from and words like that. And that means to get to the end of things, to get to the terminus, to get to the place you're intending and aiming for. Um, so if you like to kind of build these ideas into this statement, um, the lust of the flesh has an aim. It has an intention. And the intention is to cause you to step over into conscious sin, into conscious trespass um, of something. But Paul says, if we walk, if our normal life is in the realm of the spirit, you will not complete the journey of the lust of the flesh. Now, that is a, a really kind of flamboyant paraphrase, but I hope it's giving an idea of what I'm trying to say at this point. And we'll come back to that in a minute. This is from Vine, which I still recommend to everybody. Um, he says it's to finish or to bring to an end, um, frequently signifies not merely to terminate a thing, but to carry out a thing to the full, mission completed, that's it. Now, the mission completed of the lust of the flesh would be to um, succeed in getting us to engage with a conscious choice in which we choose the thing that we know we should not do. Okay, let's um, close that one up as well a bit, put it out of the way. And come on to this one. So I'm talking tonight about the normal Christian life as expected by Paul. So here is the normal expectation that the spontaneous life of the spirit in a person will ensure that we do not bring to their destination, to their purpose, the lusts of the flesh. Um, that, that's a categoric biblical statement. Whatever you believe about sanctification, You've got to fit that statement into it in, in, at some point. So that's the normal expectation. And here's then the normal step-by-step cho step choices. And this is where we're going to come across another word for walk. Let me put that one up again so you can just kind of see where it is. Here's, here's, here's walk peripateo, um, but here's another word for walk, but we'll come to it in a minute. Paul now says in, in, in Galatians chapter 5, and verses 25 and 26, he says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's have a look at some of these words. This is, this is just the word for live. That's, it's straightforward, but it's in the present tense here. So if we, are, if we are living in the spirit, if our life is in the spirit, now, Earlier on here, if you remember, he said, if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now he says this, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk. This one seems as though it's just kind of automatic. You, It's spontaneous in our life. Just be in the spirit, walk in the spirit, and you won't bring to their uh, destination um, the lust of the flesh. But now he says, and he's not contradicting himself. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And this is because this word walk is a different one. And this is a fascinating one. This is the word, this is the word stoikeo. And this means something sort of quite different. Whereas you could almost kind of say that peripateo means to kind of just amble about, just to be around, just to be doing the things of life, ordinary. This one is much more disciplined. This is stoikeo. And let me see what I can say. It, here you see it says it, it comes from stoikos, which actually means a row. And this walk actually means to walk 
in a line. It's used metaphorically of walking in relation to others, walking in rank, walking orderly, keeping in step. It's a, it's a, it's a different picture altogether. Um, and there's a whole list of here from, uh, again, from Vines, where you'll see how this word is used. So let's kind of just remind us what we're saying here. Uh, if we live in the spirit, let me put it like this. Let us keep in step with the spirit. Let's keep in file with the spirit. Let's, these are, these are deliberate choices. This is a spontaneous expansion of life that makes it so that the lust of the flesh cannot be fulfilled. This is a series of deliberate choices where day by day, moment by moment, step by step, we are moving in the spirit. We are progressing in the spirit. We are, we're heading in a certain direction. This, this has, this has target. Um, this has destination. Um, and we're to walk in the spirit. Now, well, what does that mean then? Well, I would say it, it means being sensitive to what the spirit is saying to us and to be ready to walk in the direction that the spirit gives to us. Much of our life can just be spontaneous. The old phrase uh, to be spiritually natural and naturally spiritual. That's this one walking that's this is this is being spiritually natural and naturally spiritual but there's another dimension here and i think it's an important one because this is the one of deliberate choice where we make choices and often we will make choices which are the 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 effect of which is that we're really saying no to ourselves um i'm just trying to think of a little a phrase that came to me some time ago. Um, when Paul is describing love in 1 Corinthians 13, he dis, it's a one, you know, that's this is passage, it's a wonderful passage, but he, he has this phrase and he says, love seeks not its own. I think that is such a profound mini definition of love. Agape is the love which does not seek its own. Agape is the love which consciously chooses not to seek its own for the benefit of another. That's what agape is. And in that conscious choosing, you have these steps of walking in the spirit. When you make decisions which are against your natural rights, Oswald Chambers has this phrase that he often used. Um, he would speak about um, God having to deal with my right to myself. He, he reckoned that that is the, the essence, really, of original sin, this strong desire um, to maintain my rights um, and, and to get the thing that I know I have a right to. I was uh, speaking somewhere else not so many weeks ago, and I was... I came across this thing and I was, I was thinking just how rights conscious our world is and, and how people use the language Christians too, uh, very naturally. And they'll say, we, yeah, we went away for the weekend. We, we deserve that. We thought we ought to spoil ourselves. Now I, I know it's just a way of speaking, but listen, listen to it. Listen to it. What rights do we have? Where, where did that come in? Paul is going to say later on, I've, crucified the flesh i've i don't have any rights um agape doesn't stand on its rights agape chooses to um lay down its rights to itself it um it does not look upon its own things it looks upon the things of others and these events of walking in the spirit which are often not comfortable um i i'm thinking of i remember when we had our kind of uh, uh, fellowship in, in birmingham and there were things that happened and people were in kind of difficulties of one kind or another at different times and sometimes properties became necessary and i i remember two two sisters um not natural sisters the two women in the church and one of them was a teacher, 
and uh, she had um, a, a lovely flat just um, almost next door, I think it was, to where the, the fellowship house was. Um, and it was ground floor and everything was perfect. And she had access to the garden and it was lovely. Um, and then there was a woman also in the church whose husband died suddenly and they had to relocate. Um, and they had a, a, um, an English collie, you know, these big kind of lassie dogs. Um, and she had a daughter. Um, and the sister who had this lovely ground floor flat and a very ordered life as a teacher and all the rest of it, gave up her flat and took a flat above that one with stairs and not nearly so comfortable accommodation in order for the widow and her daughter and the dog to live downstairs. That's love that's not counting its own. It's, it, it's, that wasn't easy, that wasn't comfortable, that was costly. That's choosing to walk in the spirit. That's choosing to live out the life that God has put on the inside of us. I'll tell you another story that happened a few years after that. We had a, a contact with a woman, Irish woman, whose life had been absolutely chaotic. She'd, uh, I won't go through it, just um, terrible tell. There had been two men in her lives and uh, each had fathered about four or five children. Um, all the children of the first husband had died in tragic circumstances, one after another in different ways. Um, she then, uh, oh, I won't get all the details of it, but her, her, so that was the second husband. The very first husband came back into her life. He forced himself on us. He was a, he was a kind of a full member of the IRA. He was an active um, terrorist. He threatened her, the children, what he would do with them if she didn't do this, and fathered four children. And it, it, her life was just a hell on earth. And she, we met her, and we invited her along to our house, and we did things together, and the children came, and we got to the stage where the, our children were kind of having, I think, most of their midday meals with us, and she was as well. And, and all the time she was on the run from this man. And then there was another sister in the church who had just um, bought a lovely little house in a, a place not very far from where the, the meeting was. Um, this, this lovely little house, it was, um, it was just right. It got a nice garden. It was a perfect house for a, 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 single, a single sister. And she moved out of it. She moved out of it and the Irish lady and her children moved into it. And she, the owner of the house, moved into rented accommodation in order to give first choice, a love that doesn't count itself its own, um, to give her first choice. I think that that's natural in the spirit. I think very often our common sense kind of interrupts these natural in the spirit um, urges that we have. And Paul says, this is my, another one of these mega paraphrases. This is really, if, if our life is in the spirit, let's continue to make choices in the spirit. Let's walk in the spirit. Let's head for the target. Let's keep moving in that way. And of course, the simple truth is, and this is why I put live here, is that you can't, you can't do until you be. Jesus said to those in the um, early chapter of Acts of the Apostles, he said, um, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you and you will become, that's the, the verb, you will become my witnesses. They might say, well, haven't they been his witnesses before? No, they'd been, they had been preachers of the kingdom and they'd been his disciples. But now, because the Spirit had come, a new way of life was possible. They were not just going to be talkers now. They were going to be witnesses. They were going to live out the life that God had put on the inside. It's um, a curious thing when you first kind of notice it, that uh, on several occasions, Jesus forbade people to witness to the fact that he was the Christ. Uh, you must don't, don't tell anybody. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't tell anybody. Now, to the disciple on the Mount of Transfigure, and he said, don't, for sure, said don't, don't, don't do this. Don't, don't tell anybody until I come into my kingdom. And it's just, um, why? Well, 
I think simply because they could not be witnesses because they hadn't seen him yet in all his glory and they hadn't had that spirit of his glory indwelling them. Once the spirit comes to indwell, then you will be witnesses. It doesn't say you should witness it. it, it, it it's just a simple statement of spiritual fact. This is, this is an axiom of the spiritual life, that when you receive the spirit of Jesus Christ into your life, you become a witness. It, and if you live in the spirit, you will witness. You will. So um, life comes before the doing. You have to be before you can do. And when you have become, then you can walk. And here's this, this walk about walking in a row and it's um, walking in several ways. So there's the become. I, I came across a thing here that um, interested me. Just, uh, is this, this just become. Um, that's from here. Uh, we'll go back a bit. Um, I'm coming onto the word become now. You see, some people would say, oh, well, I am conceited. Well, Paul says, don't become conceited. <laughs> when you live in the spirit, you, you, your basic nature has changed. You can live a different life. So don't become something that you're not. And it reminded me of this phrase here. In, this is in, the, in, in Romans chapter 4. And this first one is from John, of course. The word became flesh. This is an event. Jesus, the Son of God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And then in Romans uh, 4 here, it says, he's talking about Abraham, and he says, therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace. I love these phrases. Uh, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. As it is written, I have made you, okay, Notice this here. I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed in hope so that he became the father. Look at this. Look at this. Um, this step here. I have made you a father of many nations and he became a father of many nations. We have to become what God has made us. God has made us new creatures. And that new creature has to then permeate into every area of our life, every part of it. And that will happen by making conscious choices in which we don't presume on any of our rights, um, but where we think of the other brother first. Um, so let's kind of close that one up a bit okay so now we've got um the normal christian life and then the normal expectation which is a spontaneous life and then we've come into this one here the step-by-step -step choices now we're going to come and notice this this is normal this is normal now we're going to something do something which is actually not normal for someone who is living a life in the spirit for someone who is choosing to take the steps that will keep him on the path that God has chosen for him. Again, Oswald Chambers used to say that um, Adam and Eve were not sinless. They were innocent. And innocence becomes holiness as a result of temptation. And can you follow that? Of course, not yielding to temptation, but resisting temptation. It, it, they, they were not they were not created holy, they were created innocent. And when we are created, yes, we, we do have a brand new nation, nature, but then it has to develop into character. So that character, and it's character that God is after, not, not just giving us a new core, uh, but giving us a new core which spreads out into every part of our life, so that all of our life is permeated with the life of God. But there's an exceptional event that we're going to read from here. Here it is, Galatians chapter 5, verses 26, and I've, I've crept into chapter 6 and verse 1. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. 
And then he says this. This is chapter 6 and verse 1. Brethren, see this, this word. This is such a precious word. It is such a precious word. We are heirs of the Father. We are joint heirs with the Son. We are children of the kingdom. We are family. We are one. That's from the old come together days, but that's a great little chorus. These people had become one. They'd become family. And we're to treat one another as though we are family. This famous phrase, um, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I think I may have told you this before, but William Booth used to preach to his um, young officers before they were commissioned and sent out to their different posts. And sometimes he would preach um, and he would start from this verse in Galatians chapter um, five, sorry, chapter six of this one. And he would read it like this. He would say, brethren, if a man is overtaken in trespasses, kick him while he's down. And then he would pause and kind of let the shock register on the faces of the people who are speaking to it. And he'd go on to say, this is so often the way that we treat those who are overtaken in trespasses. But look, look at Paul's instinct here. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass. Now, this is abnormal. This is an exception to normal Christian life. Because in normal Christian life, you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. In normal Christian life, step-by-step -step choices, deliberate choices, keep you on the path. But now he says, if, if, I love that little word, if, not when, because this is not inevitable that you will be overtaken by trespasses. This is an if. This is, this is the way God does, so often works. He does all things, gives us all promises that pertain to life and godliness, and then provides also an if. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If, 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 not when, if. So here is an exceptional event and its remedy. It, this is what I'm calling a case study. Brethren, if a man is overtaken. Let's have a look at the word overtaken. Um, it, it really means to... to um, uh, someone who's th this is this is this is a vine look at what he says here he says the meaning here I'm, I'm going from here the meaning is not that of detecting a person in the act but of his being caught by the trespass through his being off god so something has happened to here and this man because he has not been walking stoic stoic oh he's not been in 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 tune is not being marching in rank with the way that the spirit has been leading him because of that he's be um he's not alert he's not alert to the dangers that come and then there is this trespass and the and the word kind of trespass we'll see that in a minute what that means but this is it, it it's of his being caught by the trespass um I, I don't know which greek modern greek version is referring to here when he said the modern greek version is even if a man through lack of circumspection should fall into any sin we ought to walk circumspectly i remember hearing somebody ask once what um what circumspectly mean and he said have you ever seen one of those what well, you won't have seen them now you younger people might have seen them people would build kind of brick walls and then they would kind of put concrete on the top of it and they they would embed broken bits of broken bottles into the top of the wall to kind of deter people from getting um over it and he said if you've ever seen a cat walk along the top of a wall that's got broken glass in it you've seen someone walk circumspectly <laughs> in other words you're 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 choosing every step you take your your every decision that comes you're choosing it in, in the light of the new nature that God has put on the inside. Here's a, the word trespass. This is, um, this, is a, yeah, this is a false step. 
a, a blunder. You've gone over the line. Now, I'm not for a minute um, wanting to dilute the seriousness of a trespass. Oh, a trespass is sin. There's no doubt about it. It is a sin. But it's not a sinful disposition. A single sin doesn't make someone, um, doesn't change a person's disposition in that way. I often kind of um, try to lighten what I'm saying by saying this. I have in a drawer, it's within reach here, I could show it to you. I have a bronze medal. I think it's the only award I've ever won in my life. And I don't think any of you would guess what it's for. It's for old time dancing. It's um, I got a got a bronze medal for old time dancing. My mother, who realized I didn't have many of the social graces, decided I should learn dancing. And I was sent as a 12 year old to a dancing class every Saturday morning. I, <laughs> I loathed it. I got my bronze medal and then I left it behind me. Now, I don't think any of you here, most of, most of you know me fairly well. Um, you wouldn't think of me as Ron the dancer, would you? You see, the fact that I danced once or twice, the fact that I danced in the past, that doesn't make me a dancer, does it? If you drive a bus once, that doesn't make you a bus driver, does it? Um, you, can, you can have a single trespass that doesn't have the knock-on effects of creating a disposition. Um, Adam's sin created a different disposition because an alien spirit entered into him, and we had that spirit until God comes and deals with it and in regeneration in a baptism in the spirit, which brings a destructive power against the powers of evil that are in us, and then launches us out into a new life. So here, this sin, it's serious. It is a sin. And we have a promise if we sin. If we confess our sins, that is to say, if we acknowledge, if we say the same thing about our sin as God says it, that's a Greek word homologia, which really means to say the same thing as, if we agree with God about our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It, it's God's faithfulness and his justice at work, which will guarantee forgiveness and cleansing if we acknowledge our sin. One sin does not set the course of the next day. It doesn't set the course of the mood for the next hour. One sin doesn't do any of these things. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all sins. Forgive us. Okay. So that that that's it there. This is um. This is just kind of this way of a, a false step, a blunder, and then there's this. Oh, this is a jewel of a word. Remember, he's saying here, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, and we've we've just had in the earlier part of chapter five, um, two kind of illustrations of what it means to be spiritual to have the spirit walking in the spirit, manifesting the life of the spirit and what it means to be in the flesh. And, and each of those conditions is manifest. That's to say, they will show themselves. One will show themselves in acts of sin and rebellion based on me and my rights. The other, the life and the spirit will um, manifest the spirit of God in other ways. Okay. Where are we going? Um, yes, restore. This is um, this is katartizo. You've got your word artisan almost in here. This is you're making something. And kata means to thoroughly. So this really means to adjust or put something in order to restore it. Katizo. To make, to make fit, to equip, to prepare. Um, and there's lots of illustrations we can have here. And I've just put a few of them. Um, together so that you can see them. Let me see where they're gone. Um, uh, I've, I thought I'd put one. Oh, here is this is the one I'm looking for. It here. Um, go. This is this is the story of Jesus, kind of coming to the point where he he calls uh, John and James um, 
to follow him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. Here it is. Katotidzo. And here it is. Where, where we gone. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, repair him. Repair him. He is not irredeemable. He is not irreparable. Repair him. Coming back down here. Uh, this, this is another one. This is 1 Corinthians, and they needed to know something about repairs. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together. That's that same word, cartenzo. You see, sin always separates. It separated Adam from Eve in the first place. But there is a disposition which, if it's exercised properly, will make it possible for a man to be restored so that there's oneness again in a spirit of gentleness. And then he says this, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So we'll just have a look at the word considering. And I just want to make this point here brothers that this man who has been overtaken in a sin or this woman who's been overtaken in a sin and someone recognizes what's happening um, and his his instinct then if he's in the spirit will be to restore such a one in a spirit of general no no wagging of fingers no prodding fingers into the chest restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness Considering yourself, and we'll look at the word considering. Brethren, this is not a punishment that we've just read here. It is a repair. Considering. You, you, you'll know the word, epis well, maybe you'll know the word, episcopal. Um, the word overseer in Greek is episkopos, which means someone who watches over with a sense of gentle um, authority, um, but looks over things for their well-being, to check the progress, to check how things are going on. And here it says you are to do this. You are to consider yourself. You're to look at. You're to consider. That's implying mental consideration um, and it, it, looking upon and looking carefully in Hebrews. You, you'll see this is this. These, this, this little link of words. So this action regarding a brother who has been overtaken, captured um, in a moment where he hasn't been vigilant, where he stepped out of the way, um, this reaction regarding a brother is not an impulse, but it's a thoughtful, considered response to a brother or a sister who has been taken in a trespass. And as you can see, this is remedial. This is, this is not looking for an ex, a reason or an excuse to get rid of somebody. This is the instinct of the life of God as Paul expects it to manifest itself in the early church. Yes, I know there was a lot of uh, things that were wrong in the early churches, um, but at the same time, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us great and exceeding precious promises that by them we may become partakers of the divine nature. When I was a pastor of a, a proper church <laughs> a long, long time ago, um, there was a dear lady. And I would preach some, not this, quite this, but I, I would preach about holiness and about God changing our nature. And quite often, you, you know, you used to have to stand at the door and shake hands with the people as they were going out. And uh, she would, her name was Kath, and uh, I would stand at the door and she would come and she'd hold my hand with both hands because I was just a 26 year old boy and she was an old lady. And she would kind of give me this kind of wise look and she'd say, you know, Pastor, we're only human, aren't we? And I used to say, Kath, if we're only human, that's the problem. 
if we're only human, all this is a pipe dream. It's nonsense. It's cloud cuckoo land. It's aspiration gone stark raving mad. But if we're not only human, if we are becoming partakers of a divine nature, then things that are not what we would normally call human are not impossible to us. We can live in the spirit. And if we live in the spirit as our normal place of life and trust, and if we make the choices that God makes clear to us in our stoico walk, then we'll find that this kind of life is not a pipe dream, but it's a glorious reality where God really can make his will done on earth as it is in heaven. Now I'm going to stop. <laughs> Where am I? There we go. Okay. I, am I? Can I? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Very yes. good, Ron. Very good. Thank you very much.